Let's turn in the Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We have been, uh, for the last three Sundays previous, looking at this matter of, of God's order, God's order in the church, specifically, and then because God is a God of order, His order uh, in society. Paul was writing to a society in Corinth, remember, that was, uh, it was pagan to begin with. It did not have the uh, underpinning of Jewish heritage and history of the prophets and the covenants and the law. But even in a pagan society, Corinth was particularly wicked. And Paul wanted them to be sure that if you're going to reflect the righteousness and holiness of our God to a culture, a wicked culture, that you've got to embrace his order. And so remember that, that key principle. He said, I want you to know, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. Christ is the head. He's the head over the church. And as much as he was the one who carried out God's creative intent, he is the head over creation. Paul says in Colossians, all things are held together by Christ. Head of every man is Christ. Any man you know, if you're sitting here today and you say, well, I'm not under Christ, then you are in, you are in grave danger and incredible sin. And he says the head of every woman or the head of every wife is her husband order and the head of Christ is God and so he lays these three things out remember but he puts them in an order in such a way that for you to assault and to do away with the notion of of the headship of husband to wife you have to go through the headship of Christ to every man or the headship of God to Christ so we've been looking at that the last three Sundays, and, and Paul shifts his gears a little bit, but he is still dealing with conduct in the church because he takes up the discussion of the Lord's Supper. And so now we're going to look at this today. We will, we will draw some things from it next Sunday because next Sunday being the first Sunday of the month, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We will recite our church covenant together as we do every time we observe the Lord's Supper and we will have our fellowship meal together. Now I'll tell you that because I'm hoping that you will use this time and we'll have this sermon available archived on YouTube and sermon audio in places that even in, in anticipation of next Sunday that you might refresh yourself or commend it to someone you know who's not here today. So we can make right heart preparation and so that you will see today that when Paul starts talking about some things, he is talking about a gathering of the church where they shared a meal together and in the course of that meal, they recognized, acknowledged and celebrated the Lord's Supper. That is the supper of the Lord. The supper that he instituted in the upper room when they were all gathered there they thought for Passover and that evening became the supper of the Lord which is what we mean by Lord's Supper. So 1 Corinthians 11 verses 17 to 34 I hope you found those in your Bible and if you have would you stand with me follow along as I read if you don't have a Bible with you we've got the text on the screen because we want everyone to see the scriptures. We want your sensory capacities to be engaged with this living, double-edged Word of God. Follow along as I read. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part. But there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each of you goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? 
Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. What have we read together just now? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us to take this in. I'm aware that we've read this many times. I'm aware that we're talking about a topic that we have engaged in many times. My prayer is that we'll not become complacent in the face of it, but rather we'll be quickened today to think more keenly, more biblically, more spiritually, more intentionally about the supper of the Lord. Thank you. Please be seated. In many places today, you know, there's, a, there's a mixed bag referring to the Lord's Supper today in evangelical churches. Many places it's a very solemn, serious uh, occasion. We try to make it that way here we, uh, it, because in many other places it's sort of just kind of tacked on. It's just like, oh, time to do the Lord's Supper again. I, I think I told you one time when I was growing up, and this is a reflection on me. I don't want to be a bad reflection on anybody else. When I was growing up, we had the Lord's Supper every quarter. And I knew in Sunday school, when they passed out the new quarterly, that we were going to have the Lord's Supper in church. I just tied it to that. It was just sort of a, sort of a thing I did. Uh, and it was, just, it was sort of just, well, it's time to do that again. It's a dangerous thing to be complacent. It's a dangerous thing to trivialize. It's a dangerous thing to treat as an appendage, as an add-on, almost as an afterthought the Lord's Supper. It should be seriously approached. It should be seriously attended. The professing Christian who gives a wink and a nod, who knows the Lord's Supper is coming up and says, ah, I'll be busy that Sunday. You're not drinking and eating it in an unworthy manner. You are treating it in an unworthy manner. The Lord Jesus left it as something for us to do in remembrance of him. In Corinth, there was a problem. As there are many problems in Corinth. You've learned that by now. If you've been hanging with us since chapter 1, verse 1, you know that it's, that it's, a, it's a testimony to the mercy of God that the Spirit of God instructed the Apostle Paul to speak to them in the letter to the church at Corinth. And that's why we've labeled this a, a perfect gospel for an imperfect church. It was not unusual. Jude writes in verse 12 of Jude, speaking of those who are, who are uh, disruptive, those who are, who are sowing seeds that are anti-gospel. He says, these are hidden reefs at your love feast. That's one of the terms they use for the supper of the Lord. A hidden reef would be something you would dash your boat upon if you didn't see it. As they feast with you without fear, 
Shepherds feeding themselves. He's talking about it wasn't just the, it wasn't just the, the, the people in the congregation. It was the leaders. Waterless clouds. If you've, if you've not ever been a farmer, depending on this, you, I've talked to farmers who said it's frustrating when you see what looks like a cloud bank coming. And you think, oh, we're going to get some rain. Not only farmers. Think about the fighters out in, in western Oklahoma. How they desperately need rain. And the clouds come and you think, oh, we're going to get some relief. And it turns out to just be a cloud. It's not, there's no rain in it. Waterless clouds swept along by winds. Fruitless trees late in autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Jude uses some pretty graphic language for those in the congregation who were just playing. They were just playing. The Supper of the Lord is designed to be an imitation of the Last Supper. Specifically, partaking of, of bread and fruit of the vine. It was a joyous occasion for the Christians. Look at Acts chapter 2. Uh, remember in verse 42 and following what it says, that they, con- they all continue steadfastly. Well, verse 46 says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. They, they were sharing in a common community of the gospel. But Corinth is a different story. It's that which was intended to promote harmony and unity and communion had degenerated to a social separation that was bankrupt spiritually. So Paul is going to address these things under three headings in these 17 verses. Look, first of all, he addresses the abuse of the supper. Then then the meaning and significance of the Lord's Supper, and then finally the manner in which the supper should be taken. We're going to get through at least the two, first two today, and perhaps the third, but we will definitely uh, fill it in next Sunday and the third. First of all, the abuse of the supper, verses 17 to 22, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. Think about that. Think about what is implied when, when an apostle of Jesus Christ writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says it'd be better for you not to gather than to gather and do what you do. Whew. Wow. That's hurtful. But in the first place, when you come together as a church, as an ecclesia, as a body of called out believers, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part. You see how counter helpful this is? It's, it's destructive. The Lord suffers to be a unity, one body. Ephesians 4, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. First Corinthians we're going to see later in chapter 12. One body. How can one body, saved by the same Lord, come together and have divisions among them and then deign to approach the supper of the Lord which is a symbol of unity. Then he says something interesting though. I believe it. Reports come to me that you're divisive. Well we already knew from the early chapters that one followed Paul, one followed Apollos, one followed Peter. There are already factions. We knew about that. And then he says something fascinating. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. He is not promoting divisions here. He is acknowledging that if there's anybody in the body who is serious, and he believes there is in Corinth, who've been saved by grace through faith, who, as he said in the the previous verses we studied, you follow the traditions that I gave you. If there are serious followers of Christ in a body, but not everyone is serious, then there will be divisions. That's what he's saying here. Well, how do you escape them? Well, you purpose in your heart, first of all. God, help me 
to be committed to Jesus Christ and his lordship over my life and over this church more than anything else. Help me, Lord, to submit myself to the word and not superimpose upon it my, my taste, my, my druthers, we used to say growing up. Help me to make it about you and not about me. You see, you, there's some things you intentionally go through in sanctification to be sure that you are not the divisive one, that you're not the whisperer out in the hall, that you're not the one undermining, that you're promoting. Touch my tongue, Lord. Make it be a blessing. Make it edify. Any son of Adam can criticize. That comes off the right off the vine of the fallen nature. He says, I, I believe it. So then there, there must be. And here's why. In order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. He said the, the fact of division shows that there is the real article. Because what's the alternative? The alternative is just wholesale complacency. Just that, well, it doesn't matter. Let's just, let's just go along to get along. Let's, you see, there's nothing, nothing of value in that. And so he says, this is what I've heard. That's why, that's why you're, you're worse off gathering than if you hadn't gathered. And you can understand that a little further. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Wait a minute. That's what they called it. And we don't know the frequency, but when you study some of the external documents, study the internal material in the New Testament, they may well have done this every time they gathered on the first day of the week. And it may have been out of conviction, but it also may have been out of necessity. Because what you're going to hear him talking to in a moment lets you know that there were people in the Corinthian church, just like there were in every New Testament church, some who had means and some who did not. Some who had the ability to eat all they wanted at home. And some who, this would have been the best meal they'd have had all week. So he says, when you come together, because of the way you conduct yourself, even though you may call it the supper of the Lord, it is not the supper of the Lord. It has to have more than a title to earn that title. And here he says, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. With his own meal. All right, think about the fellowship meal that we have next every, every Sunday on the first Sunday of the month. Every month we do this. We encourage you, bring food. And, and you, many of you are so trained by this. I mean, first of all, you value eating with one another, so you make it a point to be here to eat with us. You recognize the value of being a part of the body. You don't have better things to do every Sunday of the month. One Sunday of the month, you value, I want to be here with you, okay? But what if you brought your meal? You put it in the kitchen and to be heated up if yours requires heating. And it came time to, for the team involved in the setup to lay the food out. And you said, uh, don't put mine out. Excuse me? No, don't put mine out. No, I'll come in and get it and I'll serve that to my family. Now, you know, you could almost justify that with banana pudding, but still it would be wrong, right? Almost, I said. You, you said, that, that would be awful. That undermines the whole purpose of the meal. Exactly. Or if you were standing over while people were passing down the line, don't get too much of that. And something like that was going on. Listen. Each one goes ahead with his own meal. So, it, so it's almost as if when it was time to eat in the aftermath of the, of the morning teaching and, and worship and preaching, that they would just go get their own and start eating without any thought of, of anyone else. Others who did not have the capacity to bring a meal to share would be left watching. That's what he says. One goes hungry. Now they were hitting a little much, 
much of the fruit of the vine. Another gets drunk, consuming for himself. What's happening here, folks? It is the complete antithesis of what the supper of the Lord is supposed to represent. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. And so he said, that's why you can't call it the supper of the Lord. Now, again, we've got a track with him. We make two different occasions. We have, this, we have the supper of the Lord prepared on this table that we serve during the course of, of worship. And then we leave here and go to the fellowship hall and have our fellowship meal. For him, it's, it's, it's happening in one of the same context. So he says, do you not have houses to eat and drink? In other words, could you not have taken care of what you make looks like a ravenous appetite at the, at the supper of the Lord at the love feast? Could you not have nibbled on something, eaten a snack, even said, I'm going to eat before I leave and I'm going to be sure I take enough so that those who gather who may not have anything to eat, who may not have had much all, all week, will have something to eat. And I'm going to rejoice in that. He said, don't you? If you've got the means, don't you have enough food in your house to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? When would it be obvious that there are some among you who don't have the means to bring food to the table. It's when those who do have the means hoard it to themselves and then may say, well, what'd you bring? Well, we didn't bring anything. Hmm. Well, why are you here then? Why are you eating? You say, preacher, that could never happen. I want to tell you that could happen. It absolutely can happen. Now, from what I've observed in almost 13 years of fellowship meals here, I've never seen it happen here. But it was happening in Corinth. But I want you just to understand, this is not so much to chide you as it is to see what Paul is dealing with here and then make the right gospel applications to our own hearts because it may be that we're perfectly content to give out our food and have it consumed. I mean, see, I, I am a fairly content fella to, to get in line, and by the time I get to the line to eat, to realize that the, whatever, the Hernandez and Lira's broad is gone. I can, I can deal with that. I can deal with that. Because it's not about me. It's about sharing. <laughs> And I, probably, I don't think this happens here, but, but think about, just apply what we do to Corinth. Can you, somebody says, nuts. After it's over with, nuts. All the food's gone. None of my food is left. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about that kind of a mentality. So he says, he calls it a despising of the church of God if you have a, have a stingy mentality. And not only, but if you despise the church of God, do you know what you open up the possibility? You open up the possibility of humiliating those who have little. When we're supposed to demonstrate that at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ, it is level. That we make no distinction. So he says, so what shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? Do you think I'm going to say, bravo, I really appreciate what you're doing? No, I will not. I will not. This word that there are divisions is the Greek word schism. There's schisms, which some people pronounce it. The word for faction is the word, we get our word heresies from it. What's important to Paul at Corinth? Unity in the gospel. The first time you speak about your church and say, I don't like, then whatever comes after that doesn't matter because you are not promoting unity in the gospel. You're promoting yourself. And that's what he's dealing with here is the Corinthians promoting themselves. The 
The church of the Lord Jesus Christ ought to be a culture that's about others. About Jesus Christ first. Remember, you've seen the acrostic, the acrostic, how to have joy. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. That spells joy. Many in the New Testament mastered this. Barnabas was a chief instigator and promoter of this. That's why he was called the son of encouragement. When outsiders come in, we ought to, and by, by out, those from the outside come in, let me say that differently, we ought to go out of our way to make sure that they have a sense that they belong. Anyone who shows a desire of longing to be, then we should be sure that we engage in such a way to say, you belong. You belong. Secondly, the meaning and significance of the Lord's Supper, verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's interesting. I received from the Lord. When was Paul taught by the Lord? When he was Saul, he hated the idea of a Messiah. Well, some commentators think he's talking about a revelation that the Lord gave him of the night in the upper room. Just real quickly, look at some passages that would, you would promote an idea like this. Acts 18, 9 and 10. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. Keep on, in other words, appeared in a vision. Acts 22, 18. I saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. Chapter 23, 11 in Acts. Following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you've testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. And then Paul in Galatians 1, 12, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so it seems that Paul is saying, I received from the Lord. He taught me. He showed me what he did that night in the upper room. Otherwise, how does Paul know what was said? So he lays it out. He lays out Jesus' teaching on the bread associated with his body, the fruit of the vine associated with his blood. When you take what the Gospels teach on the Lord's Supper, and this is found, by the way, and we read one passage in Matthew 26, verses 26 to 29. There's another a companion passage, Mark 14, 22 to 25, and then Luke 22, 19 and 20. Take those, lay them by their side, superimpose on the side of that what Paul has to say here. Here's what you come up with. All these accounts refer to the following. Taking the bread, giving thanks, breaking the bread, the words, this is my body, cited in all three Gospels and in Paul's account here. The passing of the cup, the words blood and covenant, all these passages touch on this. The bread represents the body of Christ. This is not the first time Paul has cited this. He, he, he references it in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 when we were talking about the the incestuous man and how a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Listen to this. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. In other words, if you're saved, there is something that's been taken from you. You've delivered, delivered from the dominance of sin, being delivered from that sanctification. And he goes on and says, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. That's earlier.
It is Paul who gives us this, and, and the others do this. It's when you look at the form of this, the little word do in the Greek, put in the present tense, means practice. You could say, keep on doing this, practice this. You could render it, make this a habit in remembrance of me. It is, it is the key, it's the linchpin that lets us know that when Jesus did that in the upper room, it was not simply something we were to read about, but something we were to practice, to emulate. The idea of the blood of the covenant comes out of Exodus 24, 8, if you want to look at that real quickly. Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Jesus uses that language because he's the one who's going to cover us. We sang about it. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty state. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, we looked at this going through the books of the Old Testament on Sunday nights, the, the language of the new covenant. He says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. Though they broke the law that was on tablets of stone, I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The new covenant. The I wills of God. That wonderful, merciful administration of the covenant of grace. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his, each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. And this language is operating in the heart and mind of Jesus when he speaks what he speaks in that upper room as Paul shares that he had revealed to him by the Lord. So he speaks with authority to the Corinthians. You see, it's in the Lord's Supper. Christians remember and praise the Lord for his sacrifice. But they also anticipate his return. That's why you've heard me say through the years, it is not only a commemoration, it is an anticipation. And in the middle of that, it is a declaration when the Lord's Supper is approached according to what we're taught in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and 1 Corinthians. Yes, it is a memorial to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's an anticipation that he is coming back. It's in the Lord's Supper that the whole package is there. Jesus' life. He was the bread of life. His death, he spilled his blood. His body was broken in death. His resurrection, you show forth his death until he comes. I know he can only come if he's living. He's living. And his return. The memory of the Lord's Supper, the memory of Jesus captured in the Lord's Supper of Commemoration, memorializing his life, death, burial, and resurrection. Anticipation of his return should heighten our expectation. And see, when the Lord's Supper is, a, is taught right, approached right, embraced and received right, then it, then it should deliver the church from lethargy I submit to you, anyone who has the opportunity to share in the Lord's Supper and who passes on it is lethargic at best. There's nothing commendable about it. And the angels look at him and go, Jesus died for that person?
And they can't even muster up the energy to gather, to remember him in a service that he said, remember me? And if you, if you treat this complacently, haphazardly, indifferently, you cannot be serious to say I'm anticipating his return. I would suggest it, it demonstrates a life lived without any concern for his return. That's what Paul's saying here. I didn't make that up. That's what Paul's saying here. So the third thing is the manner. And we're going to look at that next Sunday, Lord willing. The manner. But I want to, you to know as you go, you can do this unworthily. You can do this unworthily. Paul says those who had and were doing it in Corinth, some had fallen gravely ill and some had died. I want you to pray as we anticipate gathering back next Lord's Day, Lord willing. Pray that God help me to purpose to discern the body and blood of Jesus. God, help me to slay lethargy in me. God, help me to put an ax to the root of indifference. And help me to live and others see me living as someone who simply cannot wait for Jesus to return. I think a church that that spirit gets hold of it's a church that will make an indelible impression on its culture. And brothers and sisters, make no mistake. The culture we live in is every bit as wicked, if not more wicked, than Corinth. We live in a day when language doesn't even mean anything anymore. Death with dignity used to have a meaning. Now we're told by the National Institutes of Health in Great Britain, when you starve a baby to death because that baby has a critical illness, that that's death with dignity. And if you don't think that's coming here, just listen to the deafening response from the so-called enlightened and progressives. Not one word of criticism of that. Why? Because they don't disagree with it. That's where you and I live right now. Abortion? That's fine. They say. That's not fine for me. They say that. Kid makes it out of that maze, happens not to be aborted, find out he's critically ill, just do a sort of a fourth trimester abortion there. Go ahead and kill the child out of the way. People in California who were delivered from the ravages of homosexuality now have a gun pointed at their heads and say, don't you dare write. We're going to ban your books if you write about how you can, can be delivered from that. And we're going to put you, find you and put you in jail if you speak about it. And churches, if you promote it, and you keep pointing to that Bible of yours to say that the Bible calls that sin, we're going to stop that too. That's the world you and I live in. We better, we better be full of zeal for the glory of the Lord. We better be full of zeal for the return of Christ. And it starts by remembering him, his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, an aching, aching. Look, are you the, surely as you live, there's more, you find more and more, if it never makes it out of your mouth, you find more and more, oh, Maranatha, Maranatha, 
come. Come. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Let's pray.